as we've rounded the corner into 2023, it just feels like something exciting is happening, right? You can feel it. Like, I, I love showing up here in this place. I love being around the people of the church because there's something kind of palpable in the air that you can feel like God is doing something among us, which is all him. And you see it reflected on our Wednesday nights. If you haven't been to a Wednesday night, you need to come. They're great. There's, there's classes, middle school kids. It's awesome. Um, you can see it on Thursday night in that gathering we had here. On Sunday mornings we gather. And, and I think there's even more. I know there's even more for us. But it feels really fresh. And, and to that end, we're going to have what we call a family gathering on Thursday, February 2nd. That's coming up in just a little bit. I want you to mark your calendars for this. And the family gathering will be in Wilson Hall. Now, now, this family gathering, the idea is like, you get kind of like the inside scoop of what's, what's happening at the church and where we're going. And we get some special time together. It's more intimate with one another. So I hope you'll come to this. And you might say, well, family gathering, I'm new here. Am I really family? Yes, you are. You can opt into the family. That's how this works. So if you show up on Thursday, February 2nd, you're in the family. We're, we're not real picky about that. So it's open to all of you. Um, we're going to start at 6 o'clock with dinner, and then the program will begin at 6.30 again in Wilson Hall. They tell me that there will be something that they refer to as heavy hors d'oeuvres there. I don't know. I hear heavy hors d'oeuvres, and I'm thinking a half rack of ribs, but I end up getting like one rib. So I don't know. I guess it's all relative as what you consider to be heavy, but that's going to happen here. I hope you'll be a part of it. And, and now we're in this series of Acts where we're looking to the first church, the, the earliest believers in Jesus. And what we see in them is something we can learn from. How does the church work? When God is doing something fresh in the midst of his people, what does that look like? What do we do? That's why we're in the book of Acts right now. So I hope you'll go there with me. You already heard the scripture read. We're going to kind of go through it. We're going to parse it, and we're going to look more deeply at it. And uh, I want to begin with what you just heard read which is verse 6 of the book of Acts, chapter 1. This is in the New Testament, immediately following the death and resurrection of Jesus. And here's what the scripture has to say about what happened at that time. Let's see what we can learn. In verse 6, it says, Then they, the they are the apostles, the disciples of Jesus. They gathered around him, Jesus, and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Let's take a look at this question. This question is important, I think, for the entire text today. They ask a really, I think, sensible question. And the question is, hey, are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel at this time? Now, there's a, there's a Christian thinker a long time ago who commented about this question that the disciples asked. His name was John Calvin. And John Calvin, this famous Christian thinker, said about this question, he said, there are as many errors as there are words in their question. In other words, he said, hey, their thinking wasn't quite right. As many errors as there are words. But, you know, let's be fair to these guys because I think they ask what is a, a reasonable question. I, I don't think that they were mistaken entirely. They weren't crazy because in those times, you got to, Consider this. These early followers of Jesus were living under Roman rule. These were Jewish guys living under Roman rule. And they despised being under Roman rule. They found it to be wicked. They found themselves to be mistreated. They were longing to be out from under Roman rule. This, this was a part of their story. Not only that, they were hoping to see the monarchy, the kingdom of Israel restored. And so their question was born of their feelings and what they were experiencing at that time. They said, Jesus, are you going to restore the kingdom? Are you going to make things right? And, and where Calvin is saying there's errors are in this. You see, they were thinking about a, a physical kingdom. They were thinking about a political kingdom. But Jesus, as he's going to show them, was talking about a spiritual kingdom, first and foremost. He was talking about something that couldn't be seen by the human eyes, but that was going to take over. And they were thinking really locally. It says Israel. They were thinking, hey, are you going to do something in Israel specifically? They were thinking locally, but Jesus was thinking globally. He was thinking about something way bigger 
than they could imagine in those times. Those are some of the errors. Another error, I guess, that you could say in their thinking is this. They asked, Jesus, are you going to, at this time, restore the kingdom? At this time, right now? Is it going to happen now, soon, today? And it wasn't the time, as Jesus is going to point out. Now, now here's why I think this question is an important place to start for this entire message you're going to hear today. Their question, I think, really is probably the question that many of us have in the world today. Because you look out in the world, and what do you see? Brokenness. You see a mess. You see, like, this crazy things happening. And it's not just, like, when you read the news. It's even... Like if you distill it down, you come down to your own life, your own circle. You just see things that seem like they're not quite right. They're off. And so there's this question in us, which is, God, will you make everything right? Will you swoop down from heaven and fix this? Because think of it. Our government is corrupt. You know, government is corrupt. That's not just here in this nation. It's around the world. There's corruption and leadership in government. And cities, are, there's so much violence. I feel like every day I, I pull up my phone and I open it up and there's another alert that there's been a shooting in our city or in another city somewhere in this nation. It's awful. Violence all over the place. Families broken. Broken families. In fact, there, there are families right here, right now who are, who are dealing with brokenness. It's hard difficult and then there's just confusion people are confused about many things and so there's this longing inside of it says God are you going to fix this Jesus will you make this right our question's not that different than the disciples question it really isn't and Jesus has a very unexpected approach to addressing their concerns that we're going to look at right here And I think his unexpected address of their question, their concerns, is for us today. It's for us. It's it's how we're supposed to live now. That's what we're going to see. How we're supposed to live right now. What we are supposed to be doing until he returns. So let's get into this this text. We'll look at verses 7 and 8. The disciples have asked this question. They've posed it to Jesus. Are you going to make everything right? Will you fix the brokenness of this world, what we're experiencing? And Jesus replies in verse 7. It says, he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. So he first of all sets the whole timing thing straight. He says, listen, I can't tell you that. I can't tell you when this is going to happen. You can anticipate that it's going to happen, but, but I can't tell you the date the time that's not for you to know. So in other words, he's saying, yeah, there will be a restored kingdom, guys. But it's going to look a little differently, and I can't tell you when it's going to happen. I'm sure they thought to themselves, great answer. Well, Jesus then gets into, and this is what we really want to talk about, well, then what are we supposed to do? How do we address the problems of the world? He he says what we're supposed to do. Here it is in verse 8. He says, but you will receive power. That's that's an important line. But you will receive power. You see, they were looking for power. They were looking for political power. They were looking for power to to right the wrongs. He says, yet you will receive power. But here's the thing. It's not how they thought it was going to come. He says, because you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. When the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now I want to tell you, this verse 8 that I just read to you is key to the entire book of Acts. In fact, it's key to the whole New Testament. It's key to the the entire church today. So it's one to underline. You know, if you have a Bible, you should underline that verse 8. I'll also tell you this. We have selected this verse as our verse of the year. Verse 8. Okay, Acts 1.8. Because we believe it's that important to the church then and now. And so we've got these little cards to help you. We want you to memorize this. This is a memory verse for 2023. 
It's Acts 1.8. You can pick these up in the Minton Commons. We have lots of them. Give them to a friend. Take multiple ones. You can put it in your car. You can put it on your dresser. You know, tape it to your mirror. Whatever you want to do with it. And we'll have even magnets. I think they're going to be here next week where you can put it on your fridge. Keep it in front of you. And what does it call us to do? It calls us to a mission. It calls us to live in a power to fulfill that mission. And, and I got to point this out to you because this is important. As you read Acts 1.8, this is very clear, that the power of the church comes from the Holy Spirit, not from mortals. He, Jesus said, you will receive power. You want power? You want to see change in the world? He says, you will receive power. When? When the Holy Spirit comes on you. There is a power for the church. There's a power in your life, and that power is the Holy Spirit. It's not human power. And the Holy Spirit is not a luxury. The ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life, in the life of the church, it's not a luxury. It's not like, well, maybe, we'll see if we can call upon that. You know, it's an emergency, in case of emergency, break glass kind of situation. No, the Holy Spirit is a necessity in your life, in my life, in the ministry of the church. And so we can't put the Holy Spirit in a corner somehow. We can't put it behind glass. It is absolutely indispensable. We're going to talk, of course, more about that as we go through the book of Acts. But I want to point out to you right now another key word. Okay, it's a key verse. Well, there's a key word in the verse that I really want to point out to us today. And that word is the word witnesses. Jesus says, you will be my witnesses. It's like in my Bible, it's like right in the middle of that passage, right in the heart of it. And I think that's appropriate. Because that word witness, that's one to underline, that's one to write down in your notes, that word witnesses is incredibly important to the mission of Jesus, key word. So the word witness, did a little study on this, actually shows up 29 times in the book of Acts. That's a lot. This isn't a very common word. It might be a word you didn't use all week long. The word witness shows up in the book of Acts 29 times, that tells us that there's something we should pay attention to. And so let's talk about it. What, what exactly is a witness? What does it mean to be a witness? Is that, is that evangelism? Does witness mean evangelism? Evangelism. Here's what I'm talking about. Evangelism. When, when we communicate the love of God, the message of Jesus, that reveals to us that we are sinners, when someone has a conviction that they are sinful, that they're a sinner, and they come and they, they buy into faith, they take up faith, and they make a decision to follow Jesus, that's evangelism, right? You bring people to a point of decision where they recognize they're a sinner and they need a Savior, and they find that in Jesus, and they take up faith. Is that evangelism? We love evangelism in this church. Did you know that Christ Church at Grove Farm 27, 28 years ago was founded on a passion for evangelism. The people who came together to start this church, they started with that passion in mind. And so that's an important aspect, isn't it? If you're thinking about to the ends of the earth, evangelism is indispensable. In fact, it's so indispensable to us still today that we have recently hired a person to be a director of evangelisms and evangelisms, evangelism and, and, and uh, mission. And I'm really excited about this. In fact, I'm going to introduce you to him later on this morning. We're, we're offering a class on Wednesday nights about evangelism. So don't get me wrong. Like, evangelism's really important. But is that what a witness is? Put evangelism for a moment over here. Put it in the parking lot. It's important. And we need to talk more about that. But is that what it means to be a witness? There's a difference. Here's, here's, here's what a witness is. A witness is someone who tells what they have seen and what they have heard. That's what a witness is. A witness is someone who tells what they've seen, what they've heard. So imagine that you witness a car accident, okay? And you are summoned to the court to be a witness. If, you, if you're called to be a witness in the court and you say, well, I don't want to testify. The judge 
may actually, probably will actually hold you in contempt. In contempt of court because you didn't witness. You refused to witness. A witness is obligated to testify. But you know, you can see where I'm going with this. So many people who say they love Jesus have refused to testify. Have refused to witness. And I'm just saying, Jesus may hold you in contempt. If, if you don't get serious about being a witness, because this is the commission. This is the command. This is the mission of Jesus. And he says, listen, you will be my witnesses. Not you might be. Or if you're up for it. Maybe you can be. No, no. He says, you will be my witnesses. You will testify to who I am everywhere. That's what it means to be a witness. The scriptures speak of it. I mean, if you just flipped over a couple pages, I think it's Acts chapter 4, verse 20. If you go to Acts 4, 20, you hear these same disciples when they are before the, the, the religious leaders who are grilling them. They say, hey guys, listen, you can't stop us from talking about what we have seen and what we have heard. That's Acts 4, 20. They're, they said, we're witnesses. And you can't stop us. This is what we've experienced. This is what we know is true. And you cannot stop us from talking about it. Isn't that amazing? They were witnesses. One of my favorite examples of a witness in the gospel of, of Jesus, the stories of Jesus, is in John chapter 9. And there, there's, there's a story about a man who was blind from birth. Born blind. He encounters Jesus. And Jesus heals him. Jesus heals him. And, and he's transformed. Well, as it was in those days, the news of this healing spread to the people. And again, the religious leaders come in, and they don't like it, because they're always trying to keep down like the stuff that's happening with Jesus. And so they bring this blind man in to give a testimony, to give an account. And, and they ask him, what happened? We all know you were blind. Tell us what happened. We want to know what happened. Now, they were, they were looking to trap him. They were looking to smear the name of Jesus. And this guy simply says to them, I love his testimony. He says, guys, all I could tell you is I once was blind and now I see. It's like the song. I once was lost, but now I'm fine. Was blind, but now I see. That's what he said. All I could tell you is I was blind and now I see. He was a witness. A witness is someone who simply gives an account, who tells what they have seen or heard. Jesus calls us to be witnesses. Now, I asked you about you know, evangelism. Does witnessing mean evangelism? And, and we kind of said, let's put that in the parking lot. It's an aspect of it. But I'm giving you a more narrow definition. Uh, in the same token, you could say this. Well, is witnessing advocating is it being an advocate for the gospel and for jesus in other words is it, is it someone who lays out a logical argument about faith and about jesus is that what it means to be a witness you may be wondering about that is that what i'm called to do do i have to have like a an apologetic do i have to have a a reason to defend the faith you may wonder okay do, do i need to give a persuasive convincing, convicting argument to someone to persuade them to believe in Jesus. Well, listen, advocating for Jesus in that way is absolutely also something that we as believers in Jesus, we love that. In fact, I really like advocating for Jesus. I was counting up this morning. This, this is the eighth time in two weeks that I have had a chance to advocate, to teach or preach about Jesus. I love that kind of thing. A lot of you like that kind of thing. You want to have, you know, heated conversations with people on Facebook. Go team, right? And you, you, want to, you want to advocate for what you believe. I love that passion. But I had to ask myself this question, and maybe you can ask yourself this question too. Is advocating what Jesus is, is calling me to? It could be. And again, I think it's an aspect of witnessing. There's an aspect of being an advocate in there somewhere. But I want to take us to witnessing. And I thought to myself, you know, I know I love to advocate. 
I love to be persuasive. I love to preach and tell what I think and, and get my opinion out there and for people to hear it. But do I really have a heart just to simply tell the story of how Jesus has impacted my life? Am I, am I a witness? Do I have an equal passion for witnessing? And I said to myself, God, give me a heart to be a witness. I think I like being an advocate more than being a witness. Maybe that resonates with you. And, and here's, here's the truth. The ends of the earth that Jesus speaks of are going to be reached by witnesses. Witnesses, not advocates. And here's what I mean like that. It's not guys who get up on a platform and, and talk a lot like me. Actually, God wants to use you. He wants to use witnesses to bring people and draw them to him. So this witnessing idea is really, really big. And it's really important. I cannot stress this enough. I want you to look with me and as we dive into this idea of witnessing more and more. I want to tell you one more thing about it, okay? This idea of witnessing. A person who has experienced the reality of Jesus. That's what a witness is. A witness is someone who in a very deep way has encountered God. Go back to the blind guy, the guy who was blind and was healed by Jesus. You know what he had? An encounter with Jesus. A real experience that touched him deeply. So much so when these guys put the pressure on him and they're screaming at him, he says, listen, all I can tell you is I was blind and now I can see. I met this guy and my life is changed. You do with that whatever you want to do with it. I'm a witness to what he has done. A witness is a person who's experienced the reality of Jesus. And this is why this is such an important question. Because I could talk about Jesus from a, from a head standpoint. And I could be persuasive. But, but what's really compelling is to talk about a reality that I've experienced myself very simply. And allow God to open up the doors to do with that whatever he may. A real experience with Jesus. Meaning that his love has touched me in a really personal way. That the reality that Jesus has forgiven me of my sins. And I just know how long that record is. That Jesus has, has given me new life. Has touched me so deeply that I simply say, hey guys, I was lost and now I'm found. I was blind and now I see. That, that's the power of a witness. That's what we're called to be. Someone who's experienced the reality of Jesus in a deep, deep way. A person who can even look down the corridor and see the door of death and say, you know what? I know there's something on the other side. It's as real as this table right here. The reality and the hope and the life of Jesus is that real. And I've experienced his love. I've experienced his presence. And I know it's real. And I'm just telling you I was lost and found. You see this. This is the power. Yesterday, in this room, we had an incredibly powerful, beautiful memorial service for Bradley Bakken's mom. Brad, who is our worship leader, his mom passed away on Monday after a long battle with cancer. And we had, it was a packed room, incredible testimonies, reflections by her family. And um, man, it, it was so powerful and rich because Bernadette Labakin, we have a picture of her, Brad's mom was someone who had experienced the reality of Jesus in her life. You know what she did? She testified to that, to her family, to her coworkers, to, to anyone she met. My wife took her a meal in the past year and she testified and witnessed to her through just the exchange of, of dropping off that meal. Here was a woman who had 10 years of cancer, treatment, sickness, wondering if you're going to live. And, and she had this, this Bible that was shredded to pieces because she had read it so much. And you know what she had experienced? The reality and the peace and the love of God that changed her in such a way. And so there was this powerful testimony. Her witness to what Jesus had done in her life 
transformed her family. Her family, they've all become Christians in the past decades because of who she is, to the point where her son's a worship leader. Isn't that amazing? It's the power of her testimony. She'd encountered the real Jesus. How about you? Have you encountered the real Jesus? Has he touched your life? Do you know him personally? Here's where it begins. Opening up and saying, I need this Jesus in my life. I want to know him. And he'll enter into your life. He did that for Bernadette. He'll do it for you. Now I'll tell you this. As as you consider this witnessing thing, this testifying, telling people about the reality of God, of the reality of Christ, what you've seen and heard in your life, there's an important detail here that I've got to touch on, that's this. Jesus says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, we could get into a geography lesson here, and that wouldn't be a bad thing, but we're not going to do that today. Instead, I want to point you to the reality of what this means very simply. Jesus is saying, listen, there are no boundaries, no boundaries when it comes to you being a witness to me. You guys think it's just Israel? He says, uh-uh. It goes far beyond that. You're thinking locked into a certain mode? No, it's not just that. Listen, you are called to be a witness in your home. Did you catch this in the liturgy this morning? When we had the baptism up here, I asked uh, Mike and Chris, and I said, will you by your prayers and your witness help your little boy to grow to the full stature of Jesus? You know what that means? Will you tell them about what you've experienced? Will you live that out for them? And so we're called to be witnesses in our home. You're called to be a witness in this church, and that's, that's all good. Being a witness in home and being a witness in church, that's powerful, and that's a great place to start. But Jesus says that we're to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You know how I interpret that? In other words, everywhere. Everywhere you go, that's where you're called to be a witness for Jesus. So that means in your place of work, wherever that is. You work in a school, you work in a hospital, you work in a warehouse, you work in a courtroom. You are called to be a witness in your friendships, at the gym, when they put a microphone in front of your face, whatever it is, you're called to be a witness everywhere to the ends of the earth. Now, you may be wondering, well, how in the world do I do that? So let's just do a little practice here. Make this very practical, okay? I'm going to invite uh, someone up from the, the audience here to come and help me with this. Just let's say randomly, this young woman right here in the front. Come on up here, please, young lady. You'll see why that's funny in a moment. This is my daughter, Lucy, everyone. Give her a warm welcome to the stage. So here's the deal, Lucy. Salvation is given to us to be shared. That's what we're talking about here. If, If Christ has touched your life, that salvation that you love, that's given you joy and peace, it's meant to be shared. And there's a lot of ways you could do that. We don't have time to get into all of them. Some of this comes from our evangelism class. But, but one way you could do this is through just conversational witnessing. Okay? And, and I just want to show you in a real simple way what this could look like. I give Lucy a microphone, which might be dangerous. I never know what she's going to say. So we did not rehearse this, although we did do it in the first service. We have not rehearsed this. And uh, She's just going to respond naturally, as naturally as you can when you're sitting in front of a room full of people on a platform of lights on you. And we're going to have like a conversation here, okay? So Lucy, what if uh, you and I were together and we were friends? And I said, hey, what'd you do this weekend? What would you say? Oh, I went to work. Great. Sounds like fun. What else did you do this weekend? I went conversation. To a, I went to a basketball game. Uh-huh, okay, and good. Out to lunch. Didn't hang out with any boys, did you? No. Okay, good, no. good, good. good, good. <laughs> I may respond and say, that sounds like a lot of fun. Hey, you know, this weekend, we went to church. And you say, wow, you went to church, huh? Yeah. Went to church. Our church is awesome. Man, our pastor is so good. He's just <laughs> phenomenal. <laughs> she made a face. And you know what? In our church, we're talking about, about Jesus and how the church continued his mission. I'm really thinking about that a lot. You know, and you might tell them what you're thinking about introducing Jesus in your conversations. Or let's say, Lucy, you were telling me about a hobby you enjoy, something you enjoy doing in your free time. Go ahead and do that. Tell me about something you enjoy doing. I like 
to I like to run a lot and do some hurdles. <laughs> do some hurdles, just you know, casually do some hurdles. Sure, she likes to run. She likes to exercise, and I'd say, oh, you know what? I, that's cool. I like to exercise too. I enjoy um I enjoy like cycling. It. I enjoy. <laughs> See, this is why, yeah, last time I invite her up on stage. So, <laughs> despite what you just said, I enjoy, I, enjoy, uh, I enjoy riding a bike. And, you know, when I ride my bike, um, a lot of times that's a really interesting place for me to have not only just, you know, try to lose some weight, but also to be alone with God. And I find that it's a great time for me to pray. And, and my relationship with God is, is actually strengthened through that time. I find it to be really neat. You know, you, you might just share that. Here's the point. It's, on to, it's top of mind. You're always looking for an opportunity to share with someone the hope of Jesus in you. And I know it's a little bit awkward. We're, we're just, but I'm trying to give you some ideas of the fact that if you keep it top of mind, you could share the salvation that's been shared with you. Give Lucy a round of applause. Thank you, Lucy. Yeah. So... You see all that, and you think to yourself probably, okay, I'm still not sure I could do that. I'm not sure I got the guts to do that. Or you might say, I just don't know if I want to do that at all anyways. Because I don't want to be the person who's always Jesus this and Jesus that. Okay, let me push back on that for a moment. And let me show you one last thing in our text today that maybe will convince you of the need of the power available for us to be witnesses. Okay, here we go. The very end. 9 through 11. So after Jesus had said this, after he gave him this, this mission, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. And they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Wow, this is a powerful scene. And, and let me kind of break it down for you, okay? Here's the deal. Jesus resurrected. It's come back to life. He was with the disciples, his apostles, for 40 days. And they saw him come and go in miraculous ways. One time, the book of John tells us that they were in a place with locked doors, and Jesus shows up in the middle of the room. Physicists maybe explain that to me. I don't know how that works, but Jesus had a resurrected body. And it was a body that could be touched, but somehow he was able to move and be places. And so they got kind of used to, oh, there's Jesus again. He just kind of pops up out of the ground. There he is. He's with us. And they, and they were accustomed to him now, resurrected, being with them. Had to be incredible. But they hadn't seen anything like this. Because now Jesus takes up off of the ground and raises to the heavens. This is like something you see in a Marvel movie, isn't it? it it's, it's hard to imagine. In fact, there are people who doubt this is true. But there's an interesting detail that Luke includes. Luke says that this happened how? Right before their naked, steaming eyes. Right in front of their eyeballs. They saw it themselves. They saw Jesus lifted into the clouds. I like that he included that. In other words, say, you don't believe me? Ask them. Because it happened. And as this happened, what would you do? They were standing there, probably with their mouths agape, looking up into heaven saying, what just happened? We'd seen him come and go during the last 40 days, but we've never seen anything like this. He's raised to the heavens. And they actually were rebuked by these angels. These are angels, these two people in the shining clothing. They come and say, hey, hey snap out of it. This same Jesus, he's coming back again. Now, I want to pause here for a moment, because this is interesting. You know, the apostles, as we began the story, we saw that they were very heavenly-minded. On one hand, they're thinking about whatever's going on in their day, right? And they said, Jesus, are you going to do this now? Are you going to make things right now? They were heavenly-minded. I'm sorry, they were earthly-minded on the one hand. But the other hand, now we see them at the end of this little passage, and they're looking up to the heavens. And they're also being told, nope, that's not it either. You see, here's what we have. We have an earthly responsibility to witness and a heavenly enabling by the Spirit. This is what we have. So it's not to be too earthly-minded. 
It's not to be too heavenly minded. There's something in the coming together of the two where we recognize we have an earthly responsibility to be witnesses with a heavenly enabling, the power of God in us. This is what the scripture says. As I consider the the ascension, there's a quote that I read this week. I'm going to share it with you. I thought this was compelling. And it's kind of putting, you know, us in this place of the disciples in that moment during the ascension. The, The quote says this. It says, you ascended before our eyes, and we turned back grieving, seeing Jesus leave us, only to find you in our hearts. That quote is attributed to a man whose name is on the screen there. Someone asked me recently how to say his name, and I told them, if you're from Pittsburgh, it's Augustine. If you're from heaven, it's Augustine. (laughs) A little more sophisticated, right? Right? Augustine, or Augustine, however you want to say his name, was on to something. And that's this. Though Jesus ascends to heaven, the incredible truth is, as he does, we find him, we believe, in our hearts by his spirit. And this is, this is important because Jesus ascended to the throne, the heavenly throne of God, sitting at the right hand of the Father. You know what that means? He's over all the earth. He rules over everything. And you may say, well, if he rules everything, why is there so much hunger? Why is there poverty? And why is there abuse? And why is there murder? Listen, Jesus is working all things together for the good. I can promise you that. And that should give you a confidence. Listen, when you get out of bed, there should be a confidence in you. You don't have to be afraid. Because of the ascension, If the Spirit of God has put the reality of the ascension, that Jesus is on the throne, into your heart, you don't have to be afraid. You can wake up and be courageous. You can have poise. You can stand before someone and you don't know what they're going to say when you tell them about your testimony and when you witness, and you can be unafraid because of the power of Jesus, my friends. And there's one more thing I'll point out to you about this text. And that's this. At the very end, what does Jesus, what's it say about Jesus? It says this same Jesus, this same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back again. Listen, Jesus, the one who's on the throne, is coming back again. There is a coming kingdom. He's going to return. And he is going to make everything right. And so we, you know what we should do? We got to get busy witnessing. Because God loves the world. He's called us to share this message with people and to take it to the ends of the earth. We got to go. You've got to go. What are you doing? Don't just stand there with your mouth agape. Do something. Go and tell people about the message, the good news of the reality of Jesus that you've experienced and the world will change to the ends of the earth. You hear me? This is who we are called to be as a people and as a church. And I'm so excited to see how God leads us to be his witnesses now and in the days to come. Here's what I want to do. I'm going to pray. And as I pray, I'm going to give you actually a nudge, okay, about this witnessing thing. I know this. The Lord's speaking to some people today. AK mentioned this earlier. The Lord's speaking to some of you about adoption or fostering kids. Don't ignore that. Don't push it away. Be open to it. I know this too. The Lord is probably right now, not probably, he is, in this moment, nudging some of you about being a witness, about telling people what you've seen and heard and figuring out how to do that. If you want help with that, as I pray, I'm going to ask you to stand. And I want to ask you to stand as as a point of taking a courageous step to in this room say, you know what? I'm going to stand up as a witness for Jesus. And I'd just love to really simply pray over you as you do that. So, if you are feeling that nudge to be a witness for Jesus, I'm going to ask you to stand right now and join me as I pray. Oh, Father in heaven, I thank you for those who are standing as we consider the call to be witnesses, to share what we've experienced, the reality of God in our own hearts, to the ends of the earth. Thank you, God, for the message of Jesus. I pray that it would be real to us and that we, as people who experience his love and his forgiveness and his mercy, would take the message and share it.
to the ends of the earth. Oh God, fill us with your spirit and empower us to tell people about what we have seen and heard. Oh come Holy Spirit, we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.